I've got a bit of a testimony, really. Um, <clears throat> some of you may know that a couple of weeks ago, uh, my dad remarried. You know, it had been two years since uh, mum died, and uh, dad found somebody else, fallen in love with someone else, and um, was getting married and asked me to do the ceremony and to preach at his wedding. So it was kind of, <gasps> how am I going to do this? <laughs> what am I going to do? And um, it was not at all easy. And on the day, I prayed just, you know, like never before. Lord, somehow it's got to be you. Somehow it's got to be you all the way through this. And he was with me in that. And it was so good. I had so many comments from people who were Christians. And those who weren't Christians at the end of the service who commented on the word of God, even though it was nine minutes long. That's all, nine minutes long. Um, and, and said that they'd heard God speak to them. And my, my dad and um, my new stepmom um, had a wonderful service. So God is good. He can help us to get through even the most strange and difficult situations and have the strength to face them. Um, I spoke then on 1 Corinthians 13. First letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in chapter 13. And I'd just like to give you a little bit of that because while I was preparing, I was thinking, wow, there's so much in here. And Edwina said to me, you've got 10 minutes. It's a wedding. So I had to leave it all out. And I was thinking, there's so much for Beacon here as well. Well, we'll try and do another 10 minutes now. 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> and I just want to say in summary, and I'll come back to this maybe some other time on a Sunday morning, that this passage is not all about um, necessarily uh, marriage love. It wasn't written to a couple who were getting married. Um, Paul was writing a letter of rebuke to a church that had lost its way. A church that seemed on the outside to be really full of life, to be full of all the spiritual gifts and everything that you could ever think of in a church that you would say, wow, that church is dynamite. I've got to be there because God is there. But he was saying, on the inside, there's something missing. Where it really matters, why you're doing stuff and how you're doing stuff. The whole point, the whole reason for why you're there, you've forgotten it. You've forgotten the whole reason why you're there is to, um, is love, basically. It's both to know God's love for you and to act out of love in everything that you do for other people. Why did God send his son into the world? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the message we've got, isn't it? Yes. Somehow they've forgotten to show that love to each other and to extend that love to the community that they were in. We can talk about that forever, but I want you to focus on this passage. So I don't know if we can get it up on the screen, Joseph. 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 13. We'll read it together and we'll have a very short comment a challenge for us this morning. I want you to look as you, as you read this passage at some of the things that were going on in the church which might have made it a place where you'd want to be. Some of the gifts they were exercising, some of the, um, the wonderful things that were happening um, and think, actually, what is Paul saying about this? What is the Word of God saying about the way that these things were being used? So, Paul, having spoken for um, something like, we've got 12 chapters here, haven't we? Lots and lots of words written in his letter, uh, rebuking, telling people off for all the things that they were doing wrong. Um, and then he says, but well, now I'll show you the most excellent way. 13 verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. 
and it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. In fact, it goes on to the first verse of uh, chapter 14. And he says, follow the way of love. I don't know if you picked up in there some of the things that were um, probably the church was quite famous for in, in Corinth. Can anyone pick up any of the gifts and things they were doing and saying that would have been quite spectacular, encouraging, wonderful? Anybody? Prophecy? Yeah, there are lots of prophecies going on in the church. Um, anything else? Say it out loud, really loud so I can hear. Speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues, lots of speaking in tongues. Faith. Faith, thank you. Lots of faith, faith that can move mountains. People who have stood up and said, yeah, you know, do anything in God's name, I can do it. Things were happening. Things were happening. People could do stuff. People have looked well. Well, not a lot. Not a lot. I think they've forgotten that one. That's the one we need. But yeah, they were having the gift of um, knowledge so that you could, people could understand what God, um, God's plan for, for salvation was, God's plan for the world, the things that God revealed about other people's lives that they've never known in order to sort them out. Knowledge, scary thing. All sorts of gifts like that were being exercised. But all Paul says is, look, you know, without love, these things are just like, um, just a symbol being played on its own. That's one of those symbols for me, sure. Yeah, yeah, see, it's just like that. That was a really good example. Really good. Yes, you can have all these... <laughs> That's not happened. You've got guitar fingers. But just like that. It was an awful noise, wasn't it? Terrible noise, any drummers there. Terrible, awful. Yeah, or like Paul talks about a flute or a harp or something else in the next chapter. Other instruments, just playing random notes. It says when you have these great things, but there's no love, they're nothing. They're just an annoying noise. That's all they are. They actually don't mean anything. And he looks forward to a time when all these things will be gone. Because all these things bridge the gap between the unseen and the seen. And one day we will see God. One day we will see Jesus Christ. One day there will be no need for all those things. Because we'll have his presence with us. We'll be in his presence. We'll know even as we are known. But in the middle of it all, he gives us these 15 commandments of love. Examples of love. Seven of them are positive, eight of them are negative. Don't do this, do this. But before thinking of them as a commandment, we need to know that this is how God loves us. If you're a believer this morning, this is how God is going to treat you. If you've never given your heart to him, you don't really believe in him, and you know you've never made that commitment, then in a sense you don't have full access to all of these things. You can't know these things unless you you are a believer unless you've given your heart to the Lord unless you've been forgiven and accepted by him yes God's got a kind of common grace for everybody so we have the air we breathe and the food we eat and he makes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on good and bad light but you can't know this intimate love unless you accept Jesus Christ as your saviour you can't know it and what is it Joseph if you'd like to bring up on the screen again from um, verse 4 he's not going to turn and snap at you God is kind. He wants to exercise his kindness to you, to provide for you, to comfort you in times of need, to be there at your right hand when you need him. 
You don't have to worry about God envying what you've got, do you? God doesn't envy. No way. He doesn't need to. He's not boastful, like a friend who suddenly turns against you and tries to put you down. And he's not proud. He's not rude. And he's not self-seeking. He is self-giving all the time. He's not easily angered with you. He's not. He really is not. It's going to take a lot, an awful lot, to get him angry. Because you've been forgiven and covered by the blood of Jesus. And his word says that he's forgotten. He does not call to mind our sins anymore. It's not that he doesn't know about them and he knows what you've done, but he's not going to call them back. That's what this verse is talking about. You know, we keep a record of, in our minds of what people have done to us. And we're prone to bringing them back up as a kind of weapon. To knock them over the head with them at a time when they have done something else to us. And we, You remember what you said? I remember what you said in 1976. <laughs> you called me a pig. That's what you're like. Right. Okay. Now God doesn't do that. Hallelujah. All right. He doesn't do that. You're free. Amen. Those things that you've done, the mistakes that you've made in the past, even the really terrible things, God's not going to bring them up before you again because they've been wiped out. They've been blotted out. Your sins have been blotted out. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He cast our transgressions from us. Okay, that's really, really important because sometimes we look back at our lives and you know what Satan does? He says, remember what you did. Remember how you behaved. That's who you really are. And actually, Jesus says, no, I don't remember those things. I'm never going to bring them up for you again. They're gone. And I find that such an amazing comfort because I know the things that I've done wrong. I know my past. And I know that I'm going to make some big mistakes in the future. Because that's who I am. But God has covered all those things over. And he's not going to wag his finger at me and point at those things. And say, that's what you're like. He keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. But rejoices with the truth. Do you know there's times when we delight in evil things happening to other people? Isn't that sad? At times when we think, oh, great, she didn't get that. Oh, I ain't going to get it. She's failed. He's failed. But, you know, that's not happened to me. And okay, it might not be an explicit thing, but underneath there's that sense of rivalry. There's that sense of self-preservation that says, I'm kind of glad that they've fallen and not me. Thank God it wasn't me. God doesn't delight in anything evil happening to you. He is... As Jesus was and demonstrated on earth in his physical life, he is upset, he is sad when things go wrong for you. He's moved to compassion when things go wrong. But he always rejoices with the truth. He is always looking to see you molded into the character and the maturity and the, um, the character of Jesus Christ. So that when you choose the truth, and when you choose to do the right thing, and when you choose to say the truth, and to be straight down the line, he's rejoicing with you. Even though it hurts, and even though it costs you dearly, when you choose to do the right thing, he's rejoicing with you. He's there. You might feel like he's a million miles away. Say, God, this has been so hard to do. Uh, and you know, it's cost me a friendship, or it's cost me um, financially but I'm going to stand for the truth. It's cost me my position at work because I spoke out and I stood up for the truth. Hey, God is with you. He's rejoicing with you. God always protects. He's always there protecting you. God always trusts. He believes in you. He always hopes. He's looking at your life and he's saying, you can do it. With me, you can do it. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep persevering. Keep going in that way that you've started. And you will make it. Because I am with you until the end of the age. Yeah. He always perseveres. He's not going to give up on you. So no matter what stage you've got to in your life at the moment. No matter what you're thinking of yourself. He's got a goal for you that is much greater. He's looking ahead to what you will become. 
not what you are now. Okay, so hold on to it. Hold on to him. So we need to know those things and we need to revel in them and worship God for them and give him praise for those things and let them sink in. You know, that's the character of God. Otherwise, we're going to listen to the lies of Satan when he comes to you and he tells you that you're defeated, that you've sinned one too many times, that you can't possibly please God, that you're never actually going to make it, that God has withdrawn his hand from your life and that's why you're feeling low and that's why you're feeling depressed and that's why this has gone wrong and that's gone wrong. It's not true. It's lies. This is the truth about love. This is the truth about who God is in your life if you're a believer. He's right there with you. And you need to just drink it in. You need to, to, as Jesus said, eat and drink of him. Allow your soul to be refreshed. I just want to say one more thing. This is the kind of love that he's looking for us to show to one another. When I read that list and I thought about my relationships with different people, I thought, "Uh uh-uh. God, this is scary. This is really scary. Because I know that I don't behave like this so often. I know that I'm impatient with people. I know that sometimes I'm really not kind. I'm, I try not to do as much as I could. I know there are times when I envy. Times when I boast in a roundabout way without doing it directly. Simply by saying the things that I've done or said. Or I know that that's what I'm like. And so there's a real humbling sense when you read this. God, I know I'm not like that now, but that's the character of Jesus that you're making in me. Thank you. And we need to measure our relationships by those things and remember them as we're thinking about one another and how we treat one another. In whatever you're doing in the church, whatever ministry God has given you, you need to remember that it has to be done with an attitude of love. It's different from a feeling, because if it was just a feeling, then we would not be able to do what Jesus said, when he said, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute me. Now, if that love was based on a feeling, we would not do what Jesus said, would we? We wouldn't love our enemies. We can't love our enemies. A feeling's not going to come. This is about action. When you're tempted to be impatient, that you choose to be patient, that you choose to be kind and open hearted, that you choose to step down from envy and say thank you God for what I've actually got already, I don't need to be or have what that person has, it says thank you Lord, that I don't need to boast because I know who I am in you, it's a decision that we've all got to make in our relationships and in our ministries, why are we doing it, so when you think about the Corinthian church, the reason this was written, Paul was saying to them, you need to Do these things out of love once again. You need to have the right motivation. You need to have the right how you do it and what you do. So when you're leading worship, just just an example, I'm not picking on worship leaders. When you're leading worship, hopefully it will be not because you think you've got a good voice, because you think you're good at it, or because you have to, and you're on the rotor. It won't be necessarily because you think that you've got the best way to worship and you're going to make that congregation do what you want. It'll be to worship the Lord first and foremost and it will be to show love to the rest of the congregation, to demonstrate to them how to worship perhaps. It'll be doing it with an attitude of thinking, what is the best thing for them? How can I encourage them this morning? How can I lift them up? Even if they're sat there looking at their feet with their hands under their bum doing nothing how can I encourage them okay that's what it's about isn't it to do it with love to be patient with them no matter how many weeks it takes I'm going to get them out of their seats <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah patient always believing always hoping always trusting never dismissing anybody the trouble is when we focus on timetables when we pro- focus on programs when we focus on getting through things when we focus on the fact that I have to do this this morning or I have to go through this schedule or I have to get a list of songs together to lead worship today oh God you are truly awesome truly amazing we will say with the with your word, what manner of love is this that we should be called children of God? And that's what we are. That's what we are.
all those who've trusted in you, who've trusted in the blood of Jesus, poured out on the cross for forgiveness, and have repented of their sins and come before you with a humble heart. You have accepted and you have demonstrated and will demonstrate this kind of love day in, day out. Thank you. Thank you that the past is washed away. The old is gone and the new has come. Thank you that your promises stand that until the end of the age you will be with us. That you will never let us go. Thank you that your promises stand that you will always protect, trust, hope, persevere with us week by week, year by year, as the years go by, you are faithful. Oh Lord, I pray this morning that you would remove from our our minds and our hearts the lies of the enemy and that you would set us free in this knowledge of your love. Oh Lord, I pray that this knowledge will be deepened, that we would experience and know and that we would turn in worship to you because of these things. That our souls would truly be satisfied as with the richest of food in knowing your love. And that in knowing that love we would be able to apply it to one another. We pray for every area of ministry in this church Lord that it will not take place for any other reason but to serve you and to love one another. And to love those that you are calling us to outside of the church in the community. Father God, take us away from performance. Take us away from trying to look good in front of one another. Take us away, Lord, from jealousy and envy. Take us away from irritability and impatience. And teach us to trust. Teach us to persevere. Teach us to love and to hope in one another. And to see what you see when you look at our hearts. Lord, in our relationships with each other and with our families and our friends, we pray that these things will become more and more the pattern that today as we go, that you would just teach us even one thing in each of our relationships, Lord, that we can put into practice to show one of these qualities to be like Jesus. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace because you know that we cannot do this without you. Love is all these things. Love is hard. It took you to the cross. Love is hard. It meant nails through your hands. Suffering hour upon hour. Humiliation. Pain. But also the glory of resurrection. Knowing that you had bought salvation for us. Thank you that we are now the apple of your eye. I just want to live like it. And we want to know your character in everything that we do. We pray this in your name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Oh God, you are truly awesome. Truly amazing. We will say with the with your word, what manner of love is this that we should be called children of God? And that's what we are. That's what we are. All those who've trusted in you, who've trusted in the blood of Jesus, poured out on the cross for forgiveness, and have repented of their sins and come before you with a humble heart. You have accepted and you have demonstrated and will demonstrate this kind of love. Day in, day out. Thank you. Thank you that the past is washed away. The old is gone and the new has come. Thank you that your promises stand that until the end of the age you will be with us. That you will never let us go. Thank you that your promises stand that you will always protect, trust, hope, persevere with us week by week, year by year, as the years go by, you are faithful. 
Oh Lord, I pray this morning that you would remove from our, our minds and our hearts the lies of the enemy. And that you would set us free in this knowledge of your love. Oh Lord, I pray that this knowledge will be deepened. That we would experience and know and that we would turn and worship to you because of these things. That our souls would truly be satisfied as with the richest of food in knowing your love. And that in knowing that love, we would be able to apply it to one another. We pray for every area of ministry in this church, Lord, that it will not take place for any other reason but to serve you and to love one another and to love those that you are calling us to outside of the church in the community. Father God, take us away from performance. Yes. Take us away from trying to look good in front of one another. Yes. Take us away, Lord, from jealousy and envy. Take us away from irritability and impatience. And teach us to trust. Teach us to persevere. Teach us to love and to hope in one another. And to see what you see when you look at our hearts. Lord, in our relationships with each other and with our families and our friends. We pray that these things will become more and more the pattern. That today as we go, that you would just teach us even one thing in each of our relationships, Lord. That we can put into practice to show one of these qualities. To be like Jesus. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace because you know that we cannot do this without you. Love is all these things. Love is hard. It took you to the cross. Love is hard. It meant nails through your hands. Suffering hour upon hour. Humiliation. Pain. But also the glory of resurrection. Of knowing that you had bought salvation for us. Thank you that we are now the apple of your eye. I just want to live like it. And we want to know your character in everything that we do. We pray this in your name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.